calling civil case number 17-5211, 17-5235, and 17-5329. Regents of the University of California versus U.S. Department of Homeland Security, State of California versus U.S. Department of Homeland Security, and the City of San Jose versus Donald Trump. Will Council please step forward and state your appearances for the record? Your Honor, can I make a I'm sorry, I, we represent the Garcia plaintiffs, which is another case that was related yesterday. I'm uh, sorry, I need your name, Council. I'm sorry, speak. Ethan Detmer from Gibson Dunn uh, on behalf of the Garcia plaintiffs. Uh, that's case 17-5380, right? Uh, Affirmative, Your Honor, yes, I believe that's correct. Okay, and then we call that case too. Thank right. you. Harrison, please. Good morning, Your Honor. Uh, Jeffrey Davidson, Covington and Berlin, on behalf of the University of California. Okay, welcome to you. Oh, sorry, Jeff. Good morning, Your Honor. James Aradka with the California Attorney General's Office. I'm appearing today on behalf of the state of California, as well as the states of Maine, Maryland, and Minnesota. Very good, welcome to you. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honor. Nancy Feynman of Cachet, Peter and McCarthy for the city of San Jose. Right, welcome again. Good morning, Your Honor. Mark Lynch from Covington and Burling for the Board of Regents of the University of California. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honor. Alex Berengat with Covington, also for the Regents, Your Honor. And Your Honor, it, I introduce myself, Ethan Detmer from Gibson Dunn, on behalf of the individual plaintiffs in the Garcia case. Welcome. And good morning, Your Honor. Mark Rosenbaum from Public Counsel on behalf of the Garcia plaintiffs. Okay, good. And over here. Your Honor, Sarah Winslow from the U.S. Attorney's Office, and I have with me Brett Shoemate, who's the Deputy Assistant Attorney General, and Brad Rosenberg, who's the Senior Trial Counsel, both with the Federal Programs Branch at the Department of Justice's Civil Division for the defendants. Okay, welcome to all of you. Thank you. Everybody have a seat. And we, uh, we need to come up with a plan manage the cases so that we uh, get the decisions that you need done and also that uh, they are done in with such a record that the court of appeals will appreciate and all in, all in time for to be done before I believe March 5th. Is that the date that the uh, DACA program expires? Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. So we are you know, working against a clock. That's why I called you in so quickly. Is uh, normally we wouldn't have even had this conference until sometime in December. So I have some thoughts of my own, but before I even uh, maybe they're not even good. So I want to hear from you first. And then uh, we will uh, we'll hear from the lawyers in all four cases. So we'll, 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 are you all in the same case? No. Okay. Well, One at a time. Who's going to go for who, who? Who represents the regents? Uh, I, I represent the regents. Okay. okay. You get to go first. And then after I hear from you, I want to hear from the government. And then we're going to go back and kind of back and forth and see what see what the various ideas are for managing the case. Okay, Regents get to go first. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, there's an initial issue that may need to be the subject of uh, TRO practice, which would be more rapid than the rest of the schedule, and that is the Well, no, I don't say TRO, say preliminary injunction. TROs are too fast for something this important, but maybe, maybe I can't rule it out, but preliminary injunction, provisional relief, I recognized as a possibility, but okay, well, what is that? What is and, it that's so uh, urgent that needs to keep our own? So that issue is the following. The, uh, the federal government has said uh, that uh, it will not accept DACA renewal applications uh, beginning October 5th. Uh, the problem is the individual DACA recipients have been receiving letters in the ordinary course uh, telling them that they have 120 to 150 days to renew. Uh, uh, that information that they've been getting by letter is not correct according to the policy. Uh, and so that may be an issue that needs uh, relief prior to October 5th. Uh, the government has... These are, help me out here. These would be 
uh, DACA people who have signed up already. They're on the books of the DHS. Correct. But they're, is it two years or three years? Two years. They're two years that run out. So they, the, in the normal course, re up. Correct. And so, or another two or three, is it two or three years? I can't two, remember. Is it two years. Two years. Right. So then they re up for another two years, sign up more paperwork and so forth. And, and so that process is being uh, interrupted by what? Tell me again. Uh, in the, uh, the announcement we're sending, Doc, I said the renewal applications would no longer be processed after October 5th. Uh, so it's possible that someone could receive a letter yesterday saying, in, as in the ordinary course, you have 120 days to renew, uh, but they don't have 120 days to renew according to the policy. They've got 15 days to renew. All right, so is this all that thought? I'm correct. I, I, don't want, I don't want to interrupt for more than a minute, but is that correct that uh, on October 5, uh, Renewal applications will, will no longer be entertained. You need to come to the microphone here. It's correct. Say your name again. Sure. Brett Shumate from the Department of Justice, Your Honor. I would just want, I want to be very precise about what the policy says. October 5th is a deadline for filing renewal applications for individuals whose DACA benefits expire between September 5th and March 5th. So this is uh, what DHS precisely said in the. Uh, oh, well, you're going too fast. Sorry. Say so that, that, that are too many dates in there. Please say it again slowly. Uh, if I can read from the policy memorandum, right. it says, well, DHS will adjudicate on an individual case-by-case -case basis, properly filed pending DACA renewal requests and associated applications for employment authorization documents from current beneficiaries that have been accepted by the department as of the date of this memorandum, and from current beneficiaries whose benefits will expire between the date of this memorandum and March 5th, 2018, that have been accepted by the department as of October 5th, 2017. So that is the October 5th deadline that uh, Plaintiff's Council has referred to. Just, uh, quite, it doesn't quite seem like you're, both, you're, you're referring to the same thing. But explain to me again what the, the Regents said. Explain to me what's about to expire, please. Uh, I think an example may, may be helpful. So uh, suppose there's a DACA recipient whose uh, status would expire in the ordinary course as of November 1. Uh, they have received a notice from the United States government uh, some time ago saying you have 120 days to, to renew, uh, aimed at that uh, November 1 date. Uh, under current policy, as articulated, uh, if they actually file their uh, renewal on November 1, uh, the government will reject that application because of this new deadline they've created, which is October 5th. Or is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Well, that's a concrete example of possibly an imminent problem. All right. Uh, you, you can have a seat. Uh, uh, let me continue the hearing from the regents, and then we're going to come back to you. Yeah, and just one other thing on October 5th deadline now. Uh, uh, we had another case in the Eastern District of New York, and the plaintiffs in that case had asked that the government consider extending that October 5th deadline in light of the hurricanes that had impacted uh, Texas and Florida. And I represented the court in that case that DHS is actively considering whether to extend that deadline. And DHS continues to consider how to uh, handle applications from individuals who are affected by the hurricane. So I just want to make sure the court has the most up-to-date information. Well, no, but that will only affect the hurricane victims. There might be people in California who would be affected that uh, wouldn't have anything to do with those hurricanes. So. Right, Your Honor, we, we discussed this with Plaintiff's Council this morning, and they raised the concern about these individuals who received these notices, and we assured them that we would take this issue back to DHS and, and uh, for, for their consideration. Well, good. But you see their problem. Their problem is that DHS is considering it in good faith, but they're they haven't made a decision at some point they got to say we got to go to the judge and ask for an order and then it'll all be on a hurry up basis so can you give us an idea when you're going to decide i, I can't give a give the court an idea of when dhs dhs may decide I, I would like to point out though that um, dhs made this decision on september 5th it was not immediately effective dhs effectively granted a six-month stay uh, to wind down daca in an orderly manner so 
DHS committed to continuing to adjudicate applications for renewal that were already on file and set a reasonable deadline of October 5th, which was 30 days after September 5th, to uh, require individuals to file renewal applications for the subset of, of individuals whose DACA benefits expire between September 5th and March 5th. So uh, as of now, the deadline currently stands, but uh, the fact could be a, a large group. Uh, that could be, I don't know, I'm guessing 20,000 people. So that could be a large number. Okay. Okay, you can have a seat. All right, so one, one let's put on the mental list the possibility of dealing with the October five problem. Okay, what else is on your agenda? So uh, our overall view of the, uh, the most efficient way to get to a, a, a ruling uh, uh, and subsequent appeals from that ruling is that we would file a motion for preliminary injunction. Uh, the, uh, in why, order why, to- Why would you do that rather than just get this adjudicated so that you go to court appeals on a final record as opposed to a you know, preliminary injunction record that goes up to the court of appeals on a much uh, looser standard. And uh, why, why can't we get it adjudicated in time to have your, you would then be up in the court of appeals before March 5th? And there's, a, and there's a few reasons, Your Honor. Uh, uh, first is that, uh, as we all read in the newspapers, there's a potential for a legislative process uh, that nobody in, uh, uh, that nobody wants to interfere with. Uh, and so, uh, uh, nobody wants to interfere with the what? Uh, if there's going to be a congressional, uh, uh, if, if there's going to be an act of Congress signed by the president that uh, resolves on a permanent basis uh, the uh, immigration status of DACA recipients, uh, that would be preferable for, for all concerned. Of course. And, and we would like to have breathing, right? But, 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 but well, how does that translate to a preliminary injunction? Uh, just, just the politics of it. Uh, I even saw on TV the president himself wants the DACA thing to be enacted by Congress, right? He says that's, that's that. that. And the leadership in Congress says that's what they want. And I think the world is hoping that happens, but. Uh, We have seen snafus before in Congress, so it might not happen. Yeah, and you know, somebody could say, well, yeah, we all want DACA, but we also want a big wall. And then they can't agree on that, and then nothing gets passed. That, that is a live possibility. So I think in the meantime, we got we got to do this according to the rules that govern uh, us. I mean, the, the courts. I am not a politician. I am a judge. I got to rule according to the law, and I think we can. Uh, I think we can have a decision on the merits and have you in the court of appeals uh, in time to so that the court of appeals has a good record before March five. That's my view. I think we can do it. Now, it's conceivable that we would have to do some of this on preliminary injunction. I, I understand that possibility. Yes. See, if you were to win a preliminary injunction, then you never want to try. And they want to try. On the other hand, if you lose the preliminary injunction, then you want to try immediately, and, and they don't. I've seen that. I've been on the job a long time. That's always the way it works on preliminary injunction. Whoever wins did not want to go in, but they wanted to rest on that. So uh, I I think we can decide it on the merits. Do we need let me ask this, do we need discovery in this case? Uh, Your Honor, there is uh, 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 some of our claims are Administrative Procedure Act claims. Uh, in order to adjudicate those, uh, uh, it's going to be necessary to have an administrative record uh, prepared. Uh, on the timing of that, uh, we've discussed that with the government. Uh, they anticipate they can produce the administrative record by October 13th. Uh, we've had discussions about it being even earlier, October 6th, uh, but they were not in a position to commit to that uh, this morning. Uh, assuming that that administrative record is full and satisfactory and there's not a dispute about its contents, uh, and one can always hope, 
that may largely alleviate the need for document discovery from the government although there may be a need for other types of discovery but from our perspective once we see what's in the administrative record and that's settled we'll be in a much better position to know how much more discovery may be required that's a very good point let's hold that thought let's hear from the government on the administrative record point what do you say to that uh, we agree with uh, what the plaintiff, uh, plaintiff's counsel has represented. We will make every effort to have the administrative record finished by uh, October 13th. We'll go as quick as we can. Uh, just want to reiterate about October 13th, man. We've got a, we got a, uh, we got a deadline on March 5th. You know, John, we, are, we do it sooner than that. We can certainly take that back to our clients and, and push them along. Oh, so how about if I order it? And you will meet with them. I, I, think, I think October 6th sounds like uh, it ought to be done. I have emails and everything. You know, I used to work in the Justice Department years ago, and I learned one thing about administrative records. The government always puts in there what helps them, and they leave out what hurts them. Like memos, in those days it was memos, they didn't have emails, but, but if there's an email that's, that hurts your case, that it's got to go in there. It's got to be in the administrative record. It can't just be the select stuff that supports your side. So you got to do a good job on it, but it can be done. You know, you're the one, the government is the one that has created the urgency by putting a deadline. And we, uh, we got to take that and I respect your deadline, but at the same time, you got to respect the fact that I got I to gotta get the case done. So October 6th is when you ought to give, give everybody the administrative record. Yes, Your Honor, we think your, your suggestion to get to final judgment quickly makes a lot of sense in this case. We're prepared to brief this case quickly. And uh, if I could throw out a suggested briefing schedule. No, 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 your, your Honor, may, may I make one more suggestion on the administrative record? Uh, in order to avoid a dispute about the contents of the administrative record, uh, which can slow things down, uh, which we don't want to do, uh, our uh, request would be that we be permitted to serve a targeted set of requests for production, uh, which would set out what uh, we as the plaintiffs think ought to be in the administrative record uh, and set the parameters for that discussion. Uh, Give me a couple of examples. Uh, so, for example, uh, there may be a question as to whether uh, uh, General Kelly, when he was the uh, Secretary of Homeland Security, he issued a memorandum uh, rescinding a number of other deferred action programs but leaving DACA in place. Uh, our view is that the decision making around that uh, decision uh, ought to be part of the administrative record. Uh, and so we would serve document requests that would say, uh, produce all records in connection with the decision whether or not to rescind DACA uh, beginning from uh, inauguration day forward uh, so that uh, we would all have something to look at. I mean, if they referred to DACA or whether it just deferred, referred to deferred action of any type. Uh, we, we would have to think about uh, what a reasonable s scope would be. There's a number of deferred uh, action programs you know, for example, dealing with widows and widowers you know, that, that wouldn't be related to, to this decision. Uh, but they got, they got terminated? Uh, a, a number of them did. There may be some that are still in place. Well, I, I conceive that's a, an excellent idea to take some discovery. I think, that, I think at the end here, I was going to give the both sides a chance to take some discovery and, and reduce by half the time. But here's the thing, if you do what big firms do, which is a bone crushing set of document requests with a huge number of instructions followed by a huge number of definitions and then the sub parts the lower you know it's, it's going to be a problem you need to be very reasonable and directed at the discovery that you take or you ask for all right so so let's say that uh all right, so let's say we get the administrative record and we have some problems with it, but they're manageable problems. That's then what do we do? Uh, so our proposal, uh, and, I, and this is a view shared by at least the city of San Jose plaintiffs and uh, the Garcia plaintiffs, uh, is that we would aim as quickly as we get the administrative record 
has to start preparing uh, preliminary injunction papers. We can start the legal part today, but. Uh, what would be a summary judgment motion? Uh, uh, you can't be, you know, all the other cases that I am with government, they get the administrative record, they both cross the loop to summary judgment. It's possible it could take that form, Your Honor. There are other claims other than the, the than APA claims. There are constitutional claims as well. Uh, and uh, so I don't think we're all the way down the road as far as you know, figuring out whether all of the facts are undisputed. Uh, uh, so our, our thought process had been uh, that we'd file. Uh, I think you should, I think the lady should be in the alternative. But, uh, but I'm. In other words, summary judgment and or preliminary injunction in case there are fact issues. I can see closing it in that fashion. That's a, that would be a cautious thing to do. But if it turns out that there are no, that there are no fact issues, uh, I don't see the point in uh, doing a preliminary injunction if the court can grant summary judgment based on an undisputed record. And then they could go to the court of appeals. Yeah. Your Honor, that, that, that is very helpful. And there may be pure legal issues that uh, are very amenable to summary judgment. And uh, I, I think we would give a lot, a lot of consideration to including those merits summary judgment issues in, in a paper. And we've been thinking about it as a preliminary injunction motion. But, but All that's right. Helpful. So let's hold your thought. Now let's hear from the government on your view of what I've heard so far. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, we understand the plaintiffs have concerns about what will go in the administrative record, but we think discovery at this point would be premature and unnecessary and really inappropriate. The government should have an opportunity to prepare the administrative record, and we're willing to receive any suggestions from the plaintiffs about what specifically they think should be done. Let me interrupt you on that. If we had all day and all year, okay, I would agree with you, but I think uh, that, that I think they you should respond to their discovery request if they're reasonable, even if it's not going to be in the administrative record. Our concern, Your Honor, is that, that it will likely be a fishing expedition, and if we start going down the road of discovery, we're going to take this litigation sideways, and the court won't be in a position to make a quick decision. Um, so well, if it's going too far sideways, I'll put a stop to it. But reasonable discovery, I think, because so, I know what's going to happen. You're just going to put in the things you want into the administrative record. So this is kind of a thing that help, helps keep you honest and show some of the things that you don't want the court to see. Maybe. And, and, and then there'll be a separate question of whether it should have been in the administrative record. So I'm gonna let them have some discovery on this, but let's, let's, let's go to your broader point about what do you think should be briefed in this case? What should be the schedule? So Your Honor, uh, we believe that the government has a very strong motion to dismiss. And so uh, our view coming into the hearing is that we should be permitted to file a motion to dismiss quickly within 30 days to test the allegations. 30 days is not quickly. It would have to be a lot quicker than that. In the alternative, Your Honor, I, we are comfortable with uh, the suggestion that we do cross motions for summary judgment. So I, I do think the court could get to final judgment very quickly. Um, so one approach that we've just been considering over here is we could do uh, opening uh, cross motions for summary judgment due on December 1st, uh, cross, uh, the second brief due January 15th, uh, the third brief due January 29th, excuse me, February 15th, and then a fourth brief due sometime in the end of February. Then the, the, the March 5th would come and go. And then uh, we, we would have to, almost certainly have to have some kind of preliminary injunction in place to, we, we can't let the program expire without a decision, right? Maybe you win. Maybe you win totally. I don't know what the answer, answer is on the merits, but I don't like the idea that we, we're, we're uh, fiddling while Rome burns and then suddenly the program is expired. I think we've got to have a decision well in advance of March 5 so that this can go to the Court of Appeals. Maybe you win and go to the Court of Appeals. Maybe you lose and go to the Court of Appeals. I don't know that yet. But, uh, that, that, this is, this is, see, you all are approaching this like big law firms and just long winded. Uh, you can do this on a fast basis. You can work hard and get it done to get this brief and I, and, and well brief in time. Then to put the burden on me, I have to go through it all. But I'm worried about the people involved that 
the, the DACA people are, are looking for a decision. They don't want to wait till March 5. Your Honor, our, our suggestion was for a quicker schedule that I think would be acceptable to the government, while still leaving some breathing room for the legislature, which I don't want to uh, pass up. Uh, but we were thinking of filing a preliminary injunction motion uh, and, and motion for summary judgment uh, November 1st. Uh, uh, that, that may seem uh, slower than, than Your Honor would prefer. Uh, there's reasons for it. You're giving your ears here. Okay. Uh, uh, our brief, uh, opening brief, November 1st. Uh, the federal government's response, December 6th. That's a Wednesday, right? Uh, that is a Wednesday. Wednesday. All right. And, and no, uh, their, their response when? Uh, December 6th. That's too far out. Yeah. That, that, that was their request. We're happy for that to be as, uh, as short right. as that period is. Uh, and then our reply, December 20th. Too far out. And then, and then poor judge gets on Christmas Eve, I have you to me and my staff to be going through all of your paperwork over the Christmas holidays while you all go off to have fun. See, uh, did you think about that? I mean, I will be here working on, on the, uh, a lot of things, but December 20, all the briefing is done, right? Your Honor, we certainly were not expecting the court or, or uh, his staff to, uh, to be working on it. Well, we will work on it. I, but uh, we're, we're going to have a more compact schedule. We're, we're happy to have that. All right. Okay. I got it. I'm going to give each of you a chance to say one more thing, and then I want to hear from some of the other lawyers, and then we're going to come back and let you have more to say. So you get to say one more thing, please, on case management. Uh, uh, this is. Uh, there are some claims in this case which relate to uh, due process uh, uh, in the context of information sharing. So under the DACA program, uh, applicants were assured that the information they uh, provided in support of uh, uh, their applications would not be used uh, in connection with immigration enforcement. Uh, that is, the government would not use that information to deport them or their families. Uh, in the order uh, rescinding the DACA program, there were some changes made to the language uh, that the government used to describe the circumstances under which information would be shared with the enforcement arms of the government. Uh, we have asked the government about that in the context of our meet and confer discussions, uh, and they were able to confirm this morning uh, that their understanding uh, is that the policy related to the use of information provided with applications has not changed. Uh, and uh, that representation, we think, is, uh, is important to put on the record. Is that true? That's correct. Our, our understanding is that the information sharing policy remains the same. They have not changed, but I would just uh, we want to be very clear that even the old policy said clearly that it could be changed, suspended, or revoked at any time. So, just want to make sure that's clear on the record. Well, are you trying to say that they are changing it now, or are or, or you? Well, what is the policy of the government now with respect to the, when that information can be shared with other uh, law enforcement agencies? I want to be very precise. If I can get my notebook, I can point the court to precisely where that is. But um, questions 19 and 20 on US, uh, USCIS's website. It's our guide that explains clearly when information can be shared. Um, but it's very clear in saying these policies can be changed or revoked at any time. It doesn't create any substance. It hasn't been revoked yet. No, our understanding that it has not been revoked and that the current administration is following the same policy as the prior. Does that satisfy you? Uh, it does, Your Honor. All right, thank you. Okay, uh, let's hear. You get to say one more thing. Thank you, Your Honor. I just uh, we would want to make sure that uh, however much time the plaintiffs have to file a opening brief, we would have an equal amount of time for the government. And the other thing I would just say is since we do have four sets of plaintiffs that we're concerned about duplicative briefing, we think it makes a lot of sense for the Maybe we'll have joint briefing of some sort. But I don't know about that. Okay, all right. We'll, we'll come to a schedule. All right, who else who would like to speak next? Uh, Good morning, Your Honor. James Arek, representing the states of California, Maryland, Maine, and Minnesota. Right. Go ahead. What's your view? Um, Your Honor, we uh, we share your desire to have this decided in a prompt manner. Um, clearly, there's a lot of uncertainty out there that's uh, really causing possibly unnecessary grief. We do share um, both the Council for UC's belief that there should be some possibility for the legislative process to go forth. We obviously share your 
uh, view that, that that is not that's something that you cannot rely on or take to the bank in any way. Uh, and our view is that um, having this case resolved in an expeditious manner while allowing some time for that process to play out is there's an appropriate balance to be struck there. And we think that having some time, not getting a decision, uh, not getting a ruling before year's end is uh, important to allow that process to play out. So we are, we're amenable to the vehicle that you discussed uh, across summary judgment well, motions. Well, I, I suspect that if we came, did anything close to what I, the schedule I just heard, the decision would be in January, most, maybe even February, but uh, uh, and, and I, I doubt that it would be about years in. That seems appropriate. Unless it was a request for a provisional relief, then I might have to act more promptly. Right, that seems appropriate to us, Your Honor. And let me just, um, I think this, I hope this is clear, that the, the very first issue that was brought up uh, and the term TRO was used, uh, not a term you favor, uh, but it, that specific issue is for a very discreet group of, of folks so that anything that came out of that would not apply. Uh, I, 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 as we talked about it, I guess I understood that. But okay. even then, I think you could cast it in terms of preliminary injunction motion on that limited issue. Uh, I'll also say, may I speak to discovery briefly? Of course. Um, we, uh, so we agree with the idea of helping to um, craft the, what the administrative record looks like and or additional documents pertinent that may not have made their way into that uh, record via some discovery requests. We also think that it may well be necessary for us to probe further uh, into the administrative record or what was not in the administrative record with some other discovery mechanisms. Uh, you know, request for admission, interrogatories, request for production, and possibly depositions because of some of the issues at play here, which involve um, some issues of what the decision makers were reviewing when they made the decision, how they reviewed those materials. Uh, those are decisions that could not be reflected in the administrative record, but are important to determine whether a claim that the decision was arbitrary and capricious would succeed or not. So as we make this schedule, we think it's important to consider that that may be necessary. Very hard for us to say at this point without having the administrative record, but we want to leave that possibility open. Okay. And with that, I think for now, uh, that's all I'd like to say. Thank you. All right. Uh, who's next? Good morning, Your Honor, Nancy Feynman. I wasn't sure when you made the comment about large firms who are including Cotchett, Petrie, and McCarthy. We like to think of ourselves in large in stature, but we're small we're getting larger and larger. in numbers. We are, Your Honor. Yeah, but, uh, uh, but you don't use all those bone crushing instructions and <laughs> bone crushing uh, uh, definitions. Well, I, I think uh, what I, we spent yesterday with the plaintiffs group getting together, and I can represent to the court, it's a group that's committed to working quickly to solve the problems that the rescission has created. I think what, from our viewpoint in San Jose especially, we need the administrative record to see what it is. And we are going on from yesterday and the November 1st schedule on an October 13th date. And today when we were talking, we met with the defendants this morning, so we've talked out many of these issues to try to make this more efficient. And I think we'll be able to work very cooperatively with the government, that October 6th date will help. But we want to make sure that we have enough time between the time we get the administrative record and any first filing that we don't have to say, Your Honor, hold off. We have kind of the issue. So we thought about a three-week time before we filed would be fine. So the November 1st date, we thought, was a realistic, efficient date. And then I know the problem is uh, Thanksgiving, which isn't a problem for lawyers, but if you have something that's due either right before or right after, it really does affect the staffs of the attorneys. And it's a little bit harder to ask them to give up their Thanksgiving holidays. So that's why we were reasonable with the December date. But I think that can be crunched to get it done. But the last thing to consider is there is a lot of work through a lot of the groups involved in this case with the legislative solution and pointing that, and we don't want Congress to be able to say, 
Well, Judge Alsop is resolving that. We don't have to do anything. So making sure. Well, I thought about that very problem. Honestly, I uh, I don't like being in the position where somebody could blame me and say, well, now it's in the courts. Let's just let the courts decide. Okay, I I I am worried about that. Uh, and, and that's but here's the flip side of that. If if we go slow somehow because the, 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 for that reason, uh, then we could easily wind up with the March 5 deadline coming and going with no decision. And because it's not a foregone conclusion that you would get a preliminary injunction. You have to earn it and show that you're entitled to it. Uh, so I don't, I don't like being in that position either. Yeah, so I, so, I, so uh, we got to, I think the, the, the prudent thing to do is to get this case decided before March 5 comes. And then let the legislature do whatever it's going to do. You know, the, the problem is broader. All, as I understand it, you all are, are, are trying to reinstate the DACA program. But the DACA program doesn't even apply to everybody who, who is in that category. There are date problems, there are date deadlines. Uh, and if you're not a certain age at a certain time, you don't even qualify for the program you're trying to save. So that, uh, there's a broader legislative problem than just the, is it important as DACA is, there's a broader legislative problem. So, so maybe they'll look at this in a broader context. And anyway, I, I see what you're saying on that. But my view is, I didn't ask for this case, but I got it. And I'm going to move it along so that I think I do my job, which is to get a decision before the program expires. The city of San Jose thanks you for that. And I and my firm and I, the rest of the Plans Council, I think the government are committed to do whatever. I, I think we were thinking preliminary injunction first, though I think we've been writing notes and the plaintiff side is thinking that your idea of a summary judgment and preliminary injunction I think together is a good you idea. Can imagine, you can imagine a scenario where uh, it could be that under the law, you lose. Absolutely. Right. We've it thought about be, It could be under the law, you have raised a fact question that where you would win if it was a certain scenario, but we don't know what, so that, so that we have to get more discovery, maybe even have a trial. But in the meantime, possibly there would be a preliminary injunction. That, because you might meet the standard. Uh, but you've got to meet the standard. And, and we don't have any of that now. So I would, my thinking is that you would get the administrative record, move for summary judgment, and or an alternative for preliminary injunction on, on some schedule reasonably close to what you all told me. I'll give you some dates in a minute. And, and so that I can, with enough time for me to decide before, well before March 5. And with, and with some discovery in the meantime. Thank you, Your Honor. San Jose completely agrees with you. All right, let's hear from who, who else is over there. Oh, wait, wait, wait. The government gets to respond to what I just heard. I'm sorry. Thank you, Your Honor. Just uh, one quick thing. We are, the government is happy to move as quickly as the court would like, but since you did raise the idea of discovery, I think that it's inconsistent with the court's goal of moving quickly here. And what the plaintiffs are basically alleging is that the government is presumed to act in good faith in preparing the administrative record. We need discovery to test and make sure the government puts the well, own experience has been exactly that. That the government, maybe in good faith, leaves out things that they should have put in there. And we can address that after the fact. And the no, no, after the fact will be too late. I think they ought to get some discovery along the way. And then when you're sitting there saying, does this go in the administrative record or no? I don't know, maybe not. Well, they might ask for it, so let's put it in there anyway. So uh, I, I think it's better to let them have read. I'm not saying bone crushing discovery. I'm saying limited, narrowly directed, reasonable discovery is, I think, in order here. You know, I, I think we can accomplish that goal by allowing the plaintiffs to, to offer precise suggestions about what they think should be in the administrative record by letter. We propose that. And you would reject their suggestions. Well, we're happy to consider them. Yeah, but we'll consider them, yeah. That's worth something, but it's not as good as they get to, they get the document to show me, uh, and say, look what they left out. Look, I'm, I, I, 
I just had too much experience in the real world. I think limited, reasonable discovery keeps both sides honest, and we're going to do it. So you're not going to talk me out of that. Thank you. All right. Now, who's next? Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Ethan Pepper, and I'm at Gibson Dunn. I'm a partner at a large law firm, but I do promise. Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> firm. I've heard of them. <laughs> Um, but, but, Your Honor, I, I will say I am not a fan of bone-crushing discovery, uh, and I think that Your Honor is exactly right that limited and focused discovery in this case makes a lot of sense. And I, um, I, I will give as an excuse for what I'm about to say that we've only been in this case since January, uh, January, Monday, um, <laughs> thinking about these issues since January. Um, but what Your Honor said this morning reminded me very much of what your former colleague, Judge Walker, said at the beginning of the Prop 8 trial um, when we filed that complaint and all thought we would have a PI motion. And he said something very similar to what Your Honor said this morning, which is why not develop a real record so that when this matter goes up on appeal, the Court of Appeal has the full benefit of, of, of a full record. So. Um, I think, and, and I've conferred with some of my colleagues, as we were talking this morning, um, but I think, and, and uh, the, the um, UC is, I think, on board with this, as is San Jose. Perhaps what we do is have, as Your Honor says, focused discovery uh, following the completion of the administrative record on October 6th, and then have a summary judgment slash PI uh, briefing schedule. And what I, I was going to propose was November 1st for a, a opening brief or set of opening briefs which we will keep as focused as possible. November 22 for an opposition, which is the day before Thanksgiving, and December 8 for a reply, um, which gives us a couple extra days, uh, just given the, the holiday, and a hearing if, it, if it's amenable to your honor's calendar on December 15th. Um, and then if there are fact issues, and that, that would resolve, I think, the APA claims, and if there are fact issues, and in our case, well, 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 wait, look, I thought you were talking about every, uh, no way. So that would just be for the APA statutory, uh, the, there would not be the, the remaining claims? Well, I guess what I would say, Your Honor, is the, the APA claims, I believe, I don't believe you have trials on APA matters, and so I think the APA claims would have to be resolved uh, by a, some sort of briefing. I think the other claims may or may not be in, depending on what the parties think is appropriate um, on those claims. What do you about the other claims? Well, Your Honor, I was, I was going to propose that if, if there are limited fact issues that remain, and, and frankly, our case is a, in many ways a reliance case, our own plaintiffs, our own clients' reliance on what the government has told them over the years and what the government has promised them. If live testimony makes sense, we have a a short bench trial at some point in late January or early February if there are issues that remain to be resolved following the completion of the well, briefing. Well, of the so give me one example. Are you one of the plaintiffs that have constitutional claims I can't remember? <laughs> yeah, my, my clients, yes, they are they are the individual dreamers and they are raising due process and equal protection claims. Now, are each of them already signed up under DACA? Yes, Your Honor. Right, so they're, they're registered now? Correct. Okay, so you, so just take one of your claims, uh, constitutional claims, and in a paragraph, tell me how it would, how it would work uh, at the, con the constitutional claims is what I'm interested in. And just pick one, you don't have to pick them all. Sure, uh, so, so my clients, each one of them has changed the the way they're living their lives. They have gotten clients. One of them's a lawyer. They are working on getting um, uh, a medical degree and having medical, you know, having, having patients. Some of them are teachers and have changed their lives to, um, to teach their students in, in underprivileged areas. And they've, they've taken all these steps. They've gotten these licenses. They've uh, borrowed money. They've taken all sorts of steps in order to carry out those careers and if DACA is revoked and if their reliance on it, their reliance on what the government has told them over the years is uh, disappointed, they will not be able to do those things. They will, they will, their reliance interests will be frustrated by the government's rescission of this program. And that would violate what part of the Constitution? The Due Process Clause of the Fifth Amendment. Okay, so here, it's not a class action. 
you, you have six and three. Right? Correct, Your Honor. All right, so what a, I, I would like to hear what the government says to the, well, what's your view going to be on the uh, cost, uh, on one element? Is that substantive due process or procedural? I don't know, but one of those two. What do you say on that issue? So our position on the constitutional claims, Your Honor, is that they, they fail on their face and that they're subject to dismissal, dismissal on motion to dismiss. So we, we would like to test the allegations in the complaint and move to dismiss. I think well, you can do that on your summary judgment motion. Right, Your Honor. And, and the schedule, uh, what was the date of the reply? I didn't catch that. Uh, December 8th. So we, we are comfortable with the schedule that the plaintiffs have proposed with one tweak, Your Honor, is that we would like to cross move for summary judgment. So under the proposed schedule, we would only get one brief. We would like two briefs. So we would have the last word on reply to your opposition to our yeah, well, My thought is that on the opening day, whatever it was, uh, November 1, November 1, each side would file a motion. And so we would have two different uh, Two different sets of motions going at once. I think that makes sense. So then you get the last word on your motion. I think that makes sense. All right. But what do you say? Uh, but why does the uh, why does the constitutional claim fail on its face? I mean, it, it, all these all these people have relied on what the government has said. So now the government is going to say something different. So what what do you how do you answer that? So I understand that the claim is being raised as a due process claim. And it was very clear uh, in 2012 when Secretary Napolitano created the program at the very end of that uh, memorandum creating the program and said, this memorandum does not create any substantive right in any individual. So what I anticipate we will argue in opposition to the uh, constitutional claim is that there is no due process right uh, and therefore the claim fails on its face. After June 15, 2012, right here, signed by Janet Palatano. If you look at page three, you're already about the signature. Uh, read it out loud. This memorandum confers no substantive right, immigration status, or pathway to citizenship. Only the Congress acting through its legislative authority. I'm sorry, can, counsel. I'm sorry. Only the Congress acting through its legislative authority can confer these rights. Okay, so I guess your key sentence is. This memorandum confers no substantive right. Let's just stop there. So, what is uh, what is uh, your answer to the caveat that Secretary Napolitano put in the memorandum that you were on? Your Honor, in our complaint, we quote uh, high government officials of both parties that have, over the years, said over and over again that the dreamers, as, as my clients are typically referred to in the, in the, in the media, um, can rely on this program and that they should rely on this program. Uh, I will point you to paragraphs 41 through 47 of um, our complaint. Yeah, and no, no, I'm interested. I haven't read it yet. I've read a lot of the stuff, but I've got read, read out loud for everyone's benefit uh, one of the key uh, people's uh, statements to that effect. The most recent one is paragraph 47 on our complaint, and I'll quote, on April 21, 2017, President Trump said that his administration is, quote, not after the Dreamers, and suggested that, quote, the Dreamers should rest easy. When he was asked if the policy of his administration is to allow the Dreamers to stay, President Trump answered yes. Um, that's the most recent of these statements, and there are a number of them both in writing and orally and in tweets. Um, and I'll give you an example. One of my clients, who's a lawyer down in San Diego, she has been expanding her practice um, earlier this year based in large part upon these types of representations that she's heard from President Trump and, and Paul Ryan, uh, Senator Lindsey Graham, and others and as well as the, the memorandum that Secretary Kelly issued earlier this year, which rescinded all uh, immigration policies of the Obama administration, except for DACA. She took out a five-year lease on a new office space because she was expanding her, her business, and she thought, I don't have anything to worry about. This program is going to keep continuing. Um, so that's a, a very specific example of the type of reliance that we're talking about based on
the representations of high government officials in our government. And our position is that it just can't be that the government can make promises like that to people who live in this country and then yank the, the rug out without, without warning and without reason. Your Honor, the, the, the plaintiff's due process claim is really an estoppel claim. But once the government established a policy, they can never change it because people tend to rely on the established policy. We all know that estoppel does not generally run against the government. And so, you know, if the plaintiffs are right, that the government generally is not the same thing as always. So well, I, I hope they can set a case where estoppel runs against the government from ever changing policy. I don't think they'll be able to do that. And if they're right, the government can never change course. It can never change policy. If it's, if it's true that they have a due process right on a continuation of a government policy and that it can never change, that just can't possibly be right. And we're prepared to agree to that. Okay. What, what you say to the point that if you're right, then the government can never change the policy? Your Honor, I, I can't cite a case to you right now. I won't be able to. That there, there, there is doctrine that says if the government says something, if the government treats something as a right, then it, it, it is a right regardless of the label they apply to it. And this is not to say that the government can't ever change its policies, but it certainly can't change its policies as to the people who have relied upon that policy to change their, their whole living situation, their whole lives. All right. Well, these are, this is a preview of things to come. But let's, let's continue to pause over the, what, again, on the constitutional issues. Are they going to be part of the, the briefing that you all want to do starting November 1, or is that later? I, I think you answered that already, but I can't remember your answer. And Your Honor, it was a, and I'm sorry for this, a, a, a somewhat of a hedging answer. I don't know yet. It's going to depend somewhat on the record we have and, and what we can develop in the next six weeks or so to determine what exact claims we'd move for summary judgment on. Well, consider this possibility. Let's say we, we had a whole thing going on the administrative record and just the statutory claim under the APA and did not deal with the constitutional issues. And let, let's assume the worst case for you and you lose all the APA claims. No preliminary injunction, no nothing. So then where are we on the constitutional claims and will that, will that be impossible to decide in the time before March 5? Your Honor, I think we're going to have, and, and, and again, this is something where, you know, I think we're all sort of talking about this and we have been talking about it for the past couple of days and working through how this is going to be presented. But I think there would be, after all that briefing is done and Your Honor has looked at it and made a decision, presumably at some point in January, then I think there could be a limited trial on specific issues to the extent Your Honor has left things open where there are factual issues that need to be resolved. I don't know that there will be any, but if there are, you know, we could have a limited bench trial, have a few witnesses come in if, if that is appropriate based on Your Honor's summary judgment argument. I'm sorry. See, but I don't even, I don't, honestly, I don't know what the law here is on whether or not your theory that somebody who relies on statements of Lindsey Graham on the TV, whether or not that's good enough to create a right with the doctors as it doesn't create rights. I don't know the answer to this, but, but, but I got to get educated on the, and tee up what, if we get to that point where the constitutional claims matter, I don't want to have to do it on a hurry up basis. So Your Honor, I think we, I think it is likely that we would bring those claims as a part of that briefing. And I, you know, I, I, I just don't want to say that conclusively given where we are right now, but I think it is likely we'd bring those claims in that briefing. Your Honor would be fully informed about the law and the facts related to that in that summary judgment briefing, and then could hear argument on it in December and decide it shortly thereafter. Is your thought on the summary judgment motion that you want to bring on the government side, that it would include all claims, including constitutional claims, that you would be moving for summary judgment in your favor on all of that? 
I think it's kind of a hybrid motion for summary judgment, motion to dismiss. I think we would want to, in our first brief, raise all the arguments we have, why these claims should be dismissed under the you know, right. you know, you know, you know, I mean, if you're entitled to dismissal, I don't know, but you, you could do it as a hybrid motion, but nevertheless, would you be addressing the constitutional claims? Yes, I think we would. All right. So. So if we got to the end of it, and let's say that I thought that the it should not be dismissed, uh, a constitutional claim should not be dismissed, that's not the same as plaintiffs win on the merits. It just means they live by another day. So I am worried that maybe maybe what we need is a uh, whatever the, the, the most uh, good faith motion that plaintiff's side can bring on the constitutional claim to running in parallel to the administrative claims on the same schedule. And it could easily be that at the end it's impossible to decide on that record. Well, you would have to make it. You'd have to put in your declarations by your, they would have to be subject to cross-examination and depositions about their law practice and what, you know, the reliance. And then, uh, and all the other things that you would be relying on, the government would take depositions to try to poke holes in that story. All right, here, I think, I think we ought to be looking at this figure. Wait a minute, have I yet to give everyone their chance to talk? I'm, I'm, I've lost track of so many lawyers. <laughs> but who has not had a chance to talk? I've spoken, Your Honor, but I did want to address a couple of points very briefly, if that's right, okay right, on this. I'll just say that, uh, and again, this is all preview, but just to say that boilerplate in the memo, in the Napolitano memo, is just that. I always call it boilerplate whenever they don't like it. <laughs> whenever they do like it, it's the centerpiece. But, of course. Uh, all right, but it, the, the, it doesn't say this is boilerplate. <laughs> right. The, the, the D.C. Circuit has a, a strong line of cases, though, that that type of boilerplate does not determine whether it creates a right or not. So just to say that. Um, and then the other preview is uh, uh, on the estoppel issue, the Ninth Circuit does have a very strong uh, strand of case law saying that estoppel against the federal government in the immigration context is permissible. What's the name of that decision? I don't have it in front of me, Your Honor, but I can. Right. There are a number of cases, and we'll, we will brief them fully. But just to say, again, previewing that. Thank you. So there, you're saying that the Ninth Circuit has said that the, the, the normal rule is a stop against the government does not apply. There's a That's long-standing correct. Supreme Court decision on that point. That's correct. And you're saying the Ninth Circuit has an exception in immigration cases that you think applies in this case. I would say, I would couch it in terms of um, following Supreme Court law. Uh, where, which does not rule out entirely the possibility of estoppel against the federal government and finding that in immigration context, given the incredible stakes, that they will recognize its appropriateness. They said that after, to, by maybe tomorrow, send me a, a letter. This, no, no argument, just send me the citation for that decision. I'd like to read it. Yes, Your Honor. It may be multiple citations. I think there's a few cases on point. Well, you said there was a, a line of cases, sorry. I'll give me one or two that are long in that line of cases. But make sure you said it's Court of Appeals, right? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. Very well. I will, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to, by the way, I'm going to appoint Judge uh, Sally Kim to be your discovery referee and cut in half the time for responses on the all discovery. And both sides are subject to discovery, like the six individuals. They got to stand for that position. But the, uh, could be that. Uh, the Janet Napolitano, she was present at the creation. She might be subject to deposition too. They want to take the deposition. So both sides are subject to possible depositions and discovery. I, uh, I think that ought to be even-handed. But the time for response is cut in half, and Sally Cam will be your discovery master. Uh, the uh, October 6 is the administrative record date. Both sides can move to summary judgment and or uh, preliminary injunction and or to dismiss. On November 1, 
reply or oppositions, November 22. December 8th reply. That only gives me a week with materials. We'll, we'll tentatively put it down for December 15th, but late one up being December 22. Because you, you, the schedule only gives me a, a week to look at it, but possibly we'll want. So don't make plans for December 22. But we'll see if we can do it on the 15th. Uh, I think the, that we should have at least these tracks. And can the plaintiff do this on a joint basis, or do you need? Can, can we do one joint brief? <laughs> the, the plaintiffs have uh, somewhat different claims from each other. Uh, I can certainly say that our intention is to file a joint brief and we will make best efforts to do it. And we can commit to not having overlapping arguments. Uh, well, don't, well, I want you to do more than not have overlap. I want you to have one joint brief and then if you each have unique arguments in addition, then you can supplement with that. Like, but, like a Supreme Court opinion. Huh? Yeah, like a Supreme Court opinion, we join that's us. That's the way they do it? Okay. Yeah. Well then, that's, yeah, that's the way we need to do it. Yeah, that's, that's what you mean. Yes, that's what we need to do. Majority opinion. <laughs> then you have concurring opinions. All right. Uh, but one thread is the statutory arguments of the EPA. And then a second set is the constitutional constitutional uh, arguments. Each can be styled as a motion for summary judgment and or preliminary injunction. Uh, please try to honor the page limits. I will be generous on, pay, on, on giving you more, but please try your best. But each, each of those have it. So you get 25 pages on constitutional one, 25 pages on statutory. Then it would be the opposition to both of us. So you'd be at full on the government side, you'd be doing two sets of oppositions. If you wanted to file a single one, that'd be okay. But then we come to the replies that follow the same format. You'd have the constitutional reply and the statutory reply. Meanwhile, the government, I'm sorry, I hope you go ahead and whisper in his ear. Uh, I, 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 I want to make sure you understand. Meanwhile, the government's had its own thread going. And you file your motion for dismiss and or, uh, dismiss and or summary judgment. And I know he was about to say he wants 50 pages on, the, on your one brief, right? But you were about to whisper in his ear because they are, they're going to get 50 pages. Uh, I, I'll just be generous to you on because I think you should get uh, the same number of pages as the other side gets on both the statutory and the constitutional issues. Is that what you were trying to tell me or is it something else? So Brad Rosenberg, Your Honor, from the Department of Justice. Just to make sure that I understand, we have four sets of plaintiffs and each set of plaintiffs except for the city of San Jose, has multiple plaintiffs um, that however the court sets up its briefing with the number of pages that we have a like number of pages to respond. So if there are a total number of 50 pages allowed for the plaintiffs, then the government would receive 50 pages in response or would Your it be Yeah, yeah, uh, so I was thinking that, let's, let's just go back to the opening motion by the plaintiff. They're going to have one motion, hopefully, in the best of all worlds, there will be one brief that's 25 pages long that they all subscribe to. All plaintiffs. 25 pages. Then, on your side, you get 25 pages to propose that one motion. Then, meanwhile, they get another 25 pages for their opening motion on the constitutional issues. 
And then you get another 25 pages, or a total of 50, to oppose that one. Consolidated now, amongst all of the plaintiffs, 50 pages total, in other words. That's what I'm asking for, but I also said I would give them concurring opinions, and, and I'm going to be generous in giving more pages if they need it. And just like I'll give you more pages if you need it, but you, I want you all to remember, you got a lot of lawyers there, and I got a small team, and I don't have the luxury of so the fewer pages the better. But on the other hand, this is important. I don't want to. I don't want anyone to miss out on an argument that they feel like they have to make. Do you understand what I'm saying? I understood, and I appreciate that. Good. So now, that meanwhile, in addition to all of those pages, on your own motion, you get the whole, you get your 25 pages to move to dismiss and or for summary judgment. And what I'm asking you is, is since that one motion is probably going to cover both constitutional and statutory, you know what I'm saying? Your opening motion, maybe you get 50 pages that you, you really feel you. I'll just tell you now, if you need it, up to 50, I will give it to you, but I honestly think you could do it in, in less than, I think you could do it probably in 25, but, but you, whatever you take, they're going to get in opposition. So there'll be mm -hmm. some duplicative uh, briefing here. All right? Go ahead. I did have one additional question and or thought going back to the issue of discovery um, in the interest of streamlining um, the discovery process as well as ensuring that there's quality on all sides even for any firm discovery that the government might serve. You know, we have four sets of, of plaintiffs again and the government on the other side um, and the federal rules provide for a limit to the number of interrogatories that the parties uh, can serve. And um, I was wondering if the court might consider reducing that number uh, for both sides, as well as imposing limits to the number of requests for admissions, requests for the production of documents, um, so that in light of the limited amount of time that the parties have, um, the parties are have an understanding as to the, the limited scope of discovery uh, that may be necessary. All right, uh, uh, that's a fair point to consider. Uh, let's say take all of you on the plaintiff side as a group. Can you live with 20 document requests and 20 interrogatories? And I don't have any depositions. It would, would be 20. It would be a lot fewer than 20, but maybe even none. But, but how about 10, 20 and 20 for interrogatories and document requests? I see none. I see nods at our table, so no, no, no. All right, so that, they, they like that number. How about on your side, 20 and 20? I, I think that would work around without uh, obviously, the parties can reserve right to the court, but yeah, yes. all right. You can see more. But I do want to make it clear that you are entitled to take depositions too, and I think every single plaintiff can be deposed. The, uh, that, to me, is just a normal thing. So, the plaintiffs, you, you want to, you don't have to, but there you are. No, we, we appreciate that, Your Honor, and we'll give that some thought. I, was, I stepped aside to think for a moment that I'd lost track of just how many plaintiffs there are. Um, we got six individuals, we got the university, we got four or five states, and we got the city of San Jose, right? Something like that. So there's a number of, you can go above 10 if that's what you're worried about. All right. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, well, I've lost track of where I was. Okay, now we, if we did need to have a trial, Put down February 5 as the trial date. I don't know if that's likely, but we'll have to have a final pre-trial conference that I have to figure out a date for. Please, on the uh, plaintiff side, coordinate your discovery requests. I'm not unless you want me to. I, I, my thought is that we would not full consolidate the cases per se, but we would just keep them on a, four cases on a parallel track. But they might get consolidated. They certainly would get consolidated for trial if we get that far, and they would be consolidated maybe for purposes of summary judgment and or uh, the, the, the big motion is coming up in December. 
But between now and then, I just don't see the need to do any formal consolidation, and we'll just roll along with four four related cases. Is that okay? Nevertheless, we're on your side, please coordinate your discovery requests and your briefing so that it, it uh, has the benefit of consolidation. Your Honor, can I take one matter with respect to what you're sure. concerned about? Why don't you come up here, please? And could you state your name again, please? Sure. Sam? Mark Rosenbaum on behalf of the uh, Garcia plaintiffs. Your Honor, um, if there are discovery disputes, either as to um, conducting depositions or with respect to particular claims that are made, uh, withholding documents, uh, responding, taking privilege claims, I think you're, the schedule that Your Honor has set out says we ought to have an expedited process to get those, those disputes resolved. So I think all parties would appreciate a matter so that we can get it in front of the court rapidly. Uh, have a quick meet and confer if that doesn't work. Get these matters resolved very quickly so that the schedule doesn't get delayed. Yeah, I agree with that, and uh, uh, Judge Sally Kim is going to do that. Normally, I would keep the discovery disputes for myself, but right now, starting uh, right in the middle of all this, I have a huge trial. The way will be Uber trial, and so I would not have as much time to resolve your disputes. So she's going to help me on this. Sally Kim is going to help me on the discovery. And I will ask her to do it on an expedited basis. Terrific, thank you. Sure. Uh, uh, oh, uh, one other thing I should have mentioned right at the outset. Have you done your rule, initial disclosures under Rule 26? I doubt it. Uh, but, but don't we need to do that properly? Uh, no, we have not done it, Your Honor. Uh, and uh, uh, we had been thinking that in the interest of time and because everything's moving so quickly and discovery requests are going to go out, that maybe the 26A disclosures would be swept in. But we're, we're also happy to put them together. So well, no, you have to, the rule says you've got to have a Rule 26 disclosure. Unless, you, unless everybody agrees to just waive Rule 26. Disclosure, I'll let you do it, but everybody would have to agree with that. You know, I think, yeah, I need to think about that, Your Honor, but one, one possibility, I think from the government's perspective, the submission of the administrative record would probably be the equivalent of. Yeah, but how about the constitutional claims? Uh, that's not, that's just, I mean, if you want to rest on that, but uh, I, I have a feeling that, that the, later on you would say, no, there's more you want to put in. You know, I suppose. Um, if the court were to set, and we would be open probably to discussing with plaintiffs whether or not it makes sense to waive a requirement for Rule 26 disclosures, I think that's something we need to think about. That's a fair point. Um, alternatively, to the extent that the court were to set a deadline, we would suggest that the court set the same deadline as for the submission. All right, October right. 6. I'm going to say October 6 is when your Rule 26 disclosures are due on both sides. Very well. Okay. That's initial disclosures. Initial disclosures. All right. Uh, and please follow the rule and do it the way the rule specifies. Rule 26, not my rule, the rule, the big rule. Okay? Understood very well. You're looking, you're looking quizzical. Uh, I, I wasn't trying to be quizzical. We, uh, we've, uh, we've heard in advance uh, the court's approach to Rule 26 disclosures and uh, vigorously enforcing those. And, uh, okay, good. All right, let me look at my notes. I think I'm done, but if anyone else has more to bring up, uh, we'll let you do it. Your Honor, one other matter. Sure. I know there'll be requests on both sides for the submission of amicus briefs. Um, does the court want to suggest some dates so that we can well, tell the parties? Be, uh, here's the problem with the amicus briefs. If they come in, they should. They should come in uh, at the same time as the side they're supporting so that the other side can then respond. Otherwise, they don't get a chance to respond. You know, the Supreme Court has a very practical rule on that. So you got to, if somebody's going to submit an amicus brief, they're due on the same day as the brief that they're supporting. That's perfect. All right. Um, one more, one more matter, Your Honor. Uh, we have 
University of California, uh, it is likely that we'll want to amend our complaint to add uh, some additional individual uh, plaintiffs. Uh, and uh, it, uh, we had been thinking October 6th would be a reasonable target for doing that. Uh, uh, one issue that has come up. Why, why, why should we do it sooner than that? The reason is we've been speaking with a number of individuals who may want to, be, uh, to join. Uh, a uh, principal concern that they have expressed is that by uh, publicly uh, uh, joining uh, the lawsuit, they would be subject or their families would be subject uh, to retaliation and immigration consequences. Uh, so uh, one thing uh, they would hope to be able to do is to proceed uh, under a pseudonym. Uh, and uh, we've been discussing that possibility oh, with the government. You know, I, I have allowed pseudonyms on rare occasion, but we are a public institution and the public has a right to know who it is that's seeking the relief of the court. And I won't say no to it, but I, that's not an automatic uh, grant. Of the, uh, I feel very strongly that we are a public institution and all the people out there have the right to know what goes on here and who it is that wants the court to do something. So if they, join in the case, uh, they might have to do, I don't know, did they, let me ask the Kachet firm, did, are, you, are you saying, who is the one that has the six people? Yes, I know. Okay, did you name your six yes. people? So they're, they're out there taking that risk right now, so I don't know, you might, I won't say no, but that, that's, a, that's not a clear cut winner for you. We, we understand the hurdles. I mean, to be concrete about it, they're worried that if they join this lawsuit and seek the relief that we think they're entitled to under the law, uh, that the government will retaliate uh, by deporting right. their parents. Uh, so if the, you know, we, we don't take out People file lawsuits all the time, and they have to worry about that. That's, they're not alone. Uh, and so, so, and so I, I, I just cannot say yes to that now. And you take that into account. I won't say no to it either. You can make a formal motion to that effect. Now, you're not thinking about amending to add new, are you thinking that you'd add substantive new claims to your, to your complaint? Uh, we're, we're, not, uh, we're not expecting that right now, Your Honor. There are other claims that have been raised in the other cases, and uh, it's possible we would want to be able to assert those as well, but uh, we're not anticipating that no, right now. No, we can't do this. To, we can't have a... Uh, We're often running on a whole set of many, a long list of claims, and here you are uh, making it uh, muddying the waters, and you know, and I don't know what the claims are going to be, or I don't even have your final plea yet. So I would say October 6th is pretty late to be doing that. You should be doing it sooner than that. I would say by the end of this month, you should have whatever additional pleading you're going to have ready to propose. Yeah. So that's my, I won't say that, but I'll just say that's my recommendation to you. Okay? Very well. All right. I have one other thought that uh, you might think is a little odd, but I do it in other kinds of cases. It's kind of like a tutorial. I uh, know a little bit about immigration law and immigration procedure, but not a lot. It's what I've picked up over the years on in immigration cases. I wouldn't mind having a, a session sometime in the next month on a date you can find that works, or maybe a two-hour session where both sides get to, to help educate me without argument. I, you know, it's not to give me argument, it's just to explain to me, uh, for example, the history of deferred action uh, the history of, uh, of how, how deportation works and what the difference is between deportation and removal, for example. But, but the, the main points of the immigration process uh, that had any bearing on this case, but it would not be an opportunity to argue uh, your, its background kind of help me get into the, the law. That's something you would be interested in, in doing. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh,
what is going on there, say? The, the one question we had, Your Honor, is are you, are you expecting testimony or? Oh, no, 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 just be the lawyers presenting it. The lawyers would present it. You could have cartoons uh, uh, that would help me understand the process, you know, part, step one, step two, step three. I'm telling you, I learned a lot in these uh, tutorials. And, and if, I, if I have to sit through it all, if I have to, if I have to go through voluminous uh, briefing and, and, and it's all on a crunch basis, and then in addition, I got to learn the immigration. You can see the problem. I would rather learn a little bit as we go. So it would help me. I'm just, I'm just suggesting sometimes the next three weeks, four weeks, we might have such a session. Your Honor, I, Ethan Detmer, I, I think that's a great idea. Just uh, wanted to ask what, what sort of format would be best. Would you, would you like a PowerPoint and somebody just sort of going through the process and explaining it? Or what, no, what a works limited best? number of PowerPoints would be great, like five. Uh, not, you know, I don't know if you do patent cases. In the patent cases, they, they just overwhelm you with uh, 42 slides. So I don't want that. It would be three or four slides, maybe a big poster board where you would lay out here's this step one in the process, step two. Uh, you could, uh, another one would be how the DACA program itself has been. Uh, I bet you you both would almost stipulate that, but I don't, you all know it, I don't know it yet. So how the doctor program has been uh, implemented. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll come up with a list. I think it could all be done in an hour, and maybe each side does five to seven or eight slides, and most of the boards, and, and it would be tutorial in nature, not argument. It would not be part of the argument on the, uh, the case. You show each other what you're going to present beforehand, so that somebody had an objection, maybe you can work it out. Welcome the opportunity. What do you think of that idea? The lawyer is doing it. Uh, I think it's a good idea. Oh, okay. Good. Do you have a date in mind, Your Honor? It depends a bit on the things that I don't want to get into right now. But yeah, it would be around four, three to four weeks from now. Yeah. It'd be roughly about the, a little bit before your first brief is good. Do you want to just send us an order on the date? Yeah, yeah I, would, I, would, I would give you an order on that. You know what might be helpful, Your Honor, if, if the court had specific questions. You've got to come up here. The court reporters can't. Yeah, it would be helpful if I knew what the specific questions were, but, but I don't yet know. Well, if you develop questions about the questions uh, and yeah, present it to us, that would also help I us would, focus. I would definitely do that. I've been reading up on immigration law for, uh, in the last couple of days, trying to, for example, one of the questions I had, what was the origin of the phrase deferred action? Well. I, it, it has a history, and I, uh, and I'm still trying to learn that history. It's not the, this is not the only kind of situation where the former INS has uh, used the deferred action. So, but there are other phrases like that. I can't remember what it was. I had another one that had me going for a while. So, I will give you a list of some things. But in general, it's how the immigration process, the removal process, the, uh, here's another one I had. Is it true? Somewhere I read that someone like a dreamer who was in this country, uh, if they got deported, they couldn't come back for 10 years. Is that right? Is that, is that the way it works? See, I don't, but that's what it seemed to be saying. So we'll present the information as as we think will be instructive to the court, but any questions that Your Honor has along the way, we'd be pleased to answer as okay. part of that. Uh, does anyone even know the answer to that thing? No, I just said if, if a dreamer were to be deported today. That's correct, Your Honor. Huh? That's would correct. Be a 10 year bar? Is that right? Does the government know? I can't speak to that, Your Honor. All right. Well, the, your Honor's correct. Okay. Uh, I read that, but I said that's pretty harsh. Uh, 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 maybe that. Maybe but it didn't say dreamer, it just said it was a neutral statement. Okay, so we might have a tutorial. All right. I think I've done all the damage I can do for today. And I'll get out an order that summarizes what we've done. Good luck to both sides. Thanks very much. Thank you, Your Honor.